Hi, I am so happy to be with you today to talk about skills. And cracking the skills code, I'm sure, is on the mind of all of us. We've been talking about skills for the last two days. And if you're anything like me, it's one thing to have a strategy about where you want to go with skills. It's another thing to have a plan to actually get there. So part of what we'll talk about today is how you get from one to the other. And so as we think a lot about the future, I'd like to set the stage by having you imagine. Imagine it's 2025. What does your job look like? How has it changed? How has your team changed? Your company? What's different in your life? The World Economic Forum released 21 predictions for the next 10 years. And just imagine one trillion sensors fueling the Internet of Things. 3D printed cars, 3D printed organs, implanted mobile phones, and 10% of global GDP on the blockchain. These are just a few predictions of what we're going to see in the next five to 10 years. And no matter which articles you read or which videos you watch, it's clear the world is going to be very, very different. So as we think about the future, I wanted to be able to share a few things with you today to talk a little bit about the trends that we're paying attention to at BMO Financial Group, to talk about the power of skills, focus in on what we're doing at BMO, and I'll share a few things there, and then we'll have a chance to do a little bit of a breakout and work together on how you crack the skills code. So if we start with the big trends, um, at BMO we're really lucky to be part of a number of global networks. So we're working with big companies like Microsoft and Google and, and large banks and, and other international technology organizations to be able to focus in on what the world is going to look like in the next 10 years and what we need to do to start now to be able to move the dial. And so as we think about the big trends, the big shifts that are to come, there's six in particular that we've been paying attention to. The first one, no surprise, is technology. It is both enabling and disrupting business models. It's shining a light on the skills that people need that are technical, and it's also highlighting how important human skills are to set people apart from that technology. As we look at digital, in a lot of ways it's similar, but for me I think it's really harnessing the power of artificial intelligence and other insights to be able to create the personalization of experiences. So if we were to all pull out our smartphones, I'm willing to bet we have a lot of the same models, but chances are we have pictures of kids or pets or places that are close to us and important. We may have different apps, and within those apps, we're probably customizing them in a way that works for us personally. And so every one of our devices start looking less and less alike. And so for all of our companies, Part of the challenge and the opportunity in that is to find the digital talent we need, the people with the digital transformation skills who can create the experiences that fuel that personalization. And in a lot of cases, a customer's best experience with any company drives what they expect for every other company. So there's a lot of pressure. And as we think about this shift, a big part of that personalization and the changing expectation is around simplicity. So that's one of our other big trends. And it's about choosing to be simple rather than choosing to be complex. And simple is hard. It's about very intentionally focusing in on streamlined processes, infrastructure, experience, meeting people where they are and creating just enough to create the, the right experience in the right way. And so that takes some really concerted effort and it requires some skills that are specialized to be able to hone in on what matters. And as we think about the people at the heart of that, they're changing too. We have a more multicultural and more multi-generational workforce than ever. And our customers are the same. And that brings new expectations to the workforce. It brings changing expectations of what people expect from their employer from the companies that they deal with, from every aspect of their life. And we're seeing that focus on social isn't just about social media it's, and making human connections. It's about social innovation. It's about social enterprise. It's about enabling people to be 
part of something that's bigger than themselves. So at BMO, we recently um, promoted a new purpose statement. So it's true to who we've been for over 200 years, but it actually states something that everyone in, in our company can, can actually um, catch on to. So our purpose is to boldly grow the good in business and life. Now that may not sound like a typical bank purpose statement, but it's something that really matters to us. We're kind of known as the relationship bank or uh, in some circles, the nice bank, which isn't the, which isn't the worst thing to be known as. Um, but it really matters to us how we show up in the community and how we show up with our customers and how we show up with each other. And so a lot of people say that they're, they come to our bank and come to work there because it aligns with their values and it aligns with their purpose. And companies are looking for that. They want trust, transparency, something they can believe in. And economic is the sixth category. And in a lot of ways, it's sort of the culmination of the other ones because it's the financial impact. But it also includes the, the trade uncertainty, globalization, nationalization, all of these different things that are happening in the landscape and will continue to happen over the next number of years that are causing so much uncertainty for companies and countries. And it makes the environment in which we're doing our business so much more complex. So as we think about all of these different trends, we also need to keep in mind that careers are changing. And so as we think about the people in our companies, you know, when, when people joined, um, certainly when I joined BMO uh, 33 years ago, I was a Saturday teller in high school and uh, had the opportunity to join in this, you know, the most junior role other than maybe the floor sweeper. And the idea at the time was that you worked your way up. So it was a ladder and you take on more and more senior roles. About 10 or 12 years ago, we started talking across the industry about Lattice. So it was about moving across and developing some breadth, but still generally moving up. And what we're really seeing now is people focusing in on meaningful experiences. And so those could be formal or informal, they could be big or small, and they're really unique to the individual. And they require a different kind of skill set to be that nimble. And it could include formal jobs, but it could include gig work too. And so as a company, we need to be thinking differently about how we connect, not just people to jobs, but skills to work. And so that's been really pivotal for us as we've been thinking through it. So as we think about the power of skills, more things to think about. I was reading a study recently that said the average career in the future will be 60 to 70 years long. And I kind of gasped when I read that. But then if you think about it, AI, and the advances in the health industry mean we're living longer. Um, I read an article not too long ago that said, people born in the year 2000 have a very good chance of living to 150 years old. So if you think about that, working for 70 years may not be all that unusual. <laughs> and if you layer onto that, the fact that the half-life of a skill is now only two to five years. So students coming out of university with a four-year degree could already have skills that are still dated by the time they pick up their diploma. That's a game changer for them, for universities, for companies. And so we need to do a better job of helping people develop the skills they need when they join our companies. And you know, 37% of everything you do on your job today, you probably learned in the last year. And so that shows the importance of continually renewing your skills. And it shows that we need to be doing it all the time. You're never done. And what skills do we need to be learning? So there are three key buckets of skills that we keep seeing over and over again from McKinsey Global Institute, World Economic Forum, Corn Ferry, PwC, et cetera. And so the first is higher cognitive. And that's about creativity, innovation, problem solving. It's about being able to tackle things that we've never seen, which is going to be so important over the next five to 10 years because the problems that are coming are different from any of the problems we've faced in the past. The middle is social and emotional. That's really the human skills. It's the things that set people apart from technology. So it includes empathy, resilience, judgment, and then techno technological skills, which is really the technical, the coding, the things that are required to build the bold future that we're all envisioning. And so to go a little bit deeper on that first one, 
There's a neat study. I don't know if any of you have seen it from NASA. They started in the 1990s and they took 1,600 four and five year olds and they ran them through a bunch of problems for them to solve and for the kids it was just play. But they solved almost every single problem put in front of them. And NASA decided that of these four and five year olds, 98% were creative geniuses. Now imagine, NASA followed these kids through grade school, high school, into adulthood. What do you think the percentage was by the time they got to be adults? 10%, I hear? 30? Two? We have a winner. 2%. So these kids, they went from 98% before school, 30% in grade school, 12% in high school, and 2% when they were adults. And a lot of that is because school teaches you to get the right answer. It doesn't teach you to solve problems. And so as we look forward over the next five, 10 or more years, we need to help our employees to be able to crack the problems that have never been cracked before, that they've never seen, and to be nimble in doing that. And that's a whole new space for L&D. So often we, we, we tend to default to doing more of the technical skills. There is this huge opportunity for us to change how people see their work and change how they're able to solve problems. And so at BMO, we're really focusing in on what we need to do to supercharge the business over the next five to 10 years. And it starts with business strategy, which really at its heart focuses on what do our customers need most and how do we actually meet those needs. We then translate the business strategy as we're thinking about supply and demand of talent. We focus in on the skills, what we'll need, and in what proportions across the company. Then look at the talent, ideally inside, but also outside where we need to, to go to get it. And then look at how we match those skills to work so that we can get things done within our organization. And like many of you, as we've looked around at our company, there are skill gaps and we know we need to fill them, in part because it's the right thing to do as an employer of choice and being able to give people great career opportunities. But also the reality is you can't find everything you need on the street. All companies are going after very similar talent. Gartner had a study that said by 2020, 30% of tech jobs will be sitting vacant because there isn't enough skill to fill them. And Cybersecurity Ventures said there will be 3.5 million cyber jobs sitting open by 2021. Again, because there's a gap in talent. So we need to do better within our own companies. As we've been looking at skills, we're really trying to do a bunch of different things to be able to advance our skills approach within the company. So we're looking at building a skills framework. We're focusing on a specific learning, and I'll talk, each one, talk about each one of these in a minute. Um, we're really looking at new ways of working, and we're doing targeted reskilling. So these are the places where we've put our big bets as we're looking at how do we use skills to transform how we're able to meet the problems of tomorrow. So if we start at the skills framework, we really believe that skills are the new currency for the new world. They are the way that we will be able to enable everything that we do. And so as we think about the employee experience in our company, there's a number of HR elements and we need to make sure we're using the same skills framework across all parts of these. So we have one skills library now in the company and we have grouped it in the same categories as our job families. And we're starting to tag these skills against all of our learning objects. We're using it for careers, for performance, for succession. And we're creating this connective tissue so that we're able to use the exact same language in the exact same way and filter on the same things to be able to drive transparency for employees, new insights for the company, and be able to mobilize people to match that skill, the skills to work. And so what it's really enabling us to do now that we've been doing all that mapping is think differently about how we build those skills. So in 2018, we launched BMO U, which is powered by Degreed. And we have almost 70% of our entire employee population who's now using it. So we're super jazzed about that although we're continuing to push because we need to make sure that people don't only come and come back and come back, but come back again. 
and that they have compelling reasons to do so. So as we launched it, it was all about empowering our ploy employees to learn what they wanted in the way that they wanted for their job, for their career, for their personal passions, and for the future of work. We've also been using it strategically as a way for us to introduce that push content, the things that we have to have all 46,000 of our employees learning. And every six weeks or so, injecting a stream of content into the platform to keep them coming back. And so as we think about the targeted skills for the future, we've been looking at building technical skills as well as building human skills. And when it comes to the technical skills, we're looking at it in layers. So we're looking at what do, do all 46,000 people need to know? How do we raise the waterline for them so no matter what they do in the company, they're targeting in and being able to compete for the future? For experts, how do we keep them at the top of their game because the world is changing so fast? And how do we keep them staying current? And then for leaders, how do we really equip them to lead in a new context? Because the problems they'll be leading through in the coming years aren't the same ones they've done in the past. And so that's the approach that we've been taking to content, and we haven't just been doing it ourselves. We've been partnering with uh, leading content experts, with universities on you know, certificate programs, degree programs, and we're granting digital badges for people who learn and apply skills. So that way they can actually get recognized and rewarded for the learning they're doing. And so our future of work program we call BMO Forward. And so there are four streams that we've introduced so far this year starting in March with Data Smart, which is data science, analytics, AI, machine learning, robotics, big data, et cetera. And it's now available to every single person in our company of over 22 countries. In April, we launched CyberSmart, which is cybersecurity, phishing, et cetera, related concepts. TechSmart in June, which is Digitech and workplace tools. And then just about two weeks ago, we launched Simplify and Accelerate Smart which is change, process excellence, transforming how we work, agile, et cetera. And so more and more employees are jumping into this voluntary learning because they're seeing the value in it and people are already starting to, look to earn badges and post them socially outside our company. And so if we go a little bit deeper on Data Smart, these are some early results. And so we've had, we're nearing 4,000 people who have jumped in to be able to start to learn about these concepts. And about two thirds of them are actually Gen X and boomers, which we thought was pretty neat. Um, the learning is about two to three hours and that includes both learning and application. And we've got a learning community that we've set up at the end of each of these streams. So once people have done the learning, they can stay connected. They can keep their learning alive. They can share resources. We can pose questions of them and they can interact with each other. And we're already seeing some interesting moving of the dial. So for example, out of the people who've taken the program so far, we saw a 26 point bump in their understanding and interest in applying those data concepts to the job they already have. And an 11 point bump in people who are actually interested in exploring a data science job now that they've had an introduction to this space and they're going deeper. We just launched uh, recently what we call Data Smart 2. We need a, a sexier title for it. Um, but it actually is taking content from MIT and it goes into approximately 200 hours of learning on the foundations of math and the foundations of science. So people who are in any role in the company who actually want to go deeper can. And they can start to build real world skills in a deep way. And so one of the other ways we're actually enabling people to apply the, or the, the skills that they're developing is through hashtag help wanted. So we've been piloting it and it's putting out opportunities where leaders will say, hey, I have this opportunity for two hours, two days, two weeks, what have you. I need somebody with these skills who can jump in to do this work. And employees put up their hand and they're able to lean in without leaving their day job. And so the uh, CHRO at our company has now challenged us to move from pilot to test it at scale with up to 10,000 employees in the next year. So that starts to create the internal gig economy within our own company. And it makes it so much easier for people to move around without committing to a formal change in job. They build their networks, they apply skills, and they're really able to stretch out in different ways. And so I, I've talked a lot about the upskilling elements that we're doing. The other piece that we're focusing in on is reskilling. 
And one of the best stories I've heard about reskilling is coding for coal miners. And so if you haven't checked out the YouTube video, I encourage you to do so. It's a great story about a number of coal miners in the US and a coding company came and helped them build coding skills. And now I believe they're actually running their own company for coding. And so on the surface, coding and coal mining may not seem all that similar, but in a lot of ways, there are a lot of similarities. You have to be able to see the big picture. You have to be able to focus in on the details, work systematically to get things done. And so by looking at the DNA that's in common between these two seemingly disparate roles, we're able to think much more creatively about how we match people to what needs to get done. So we're trying to take a page from that book as we think about reskilling, and we look at the roles in our company that may be vulnerable to automation. And we start to think about the work that will need to get done, and how do we focus in on the skills we need to develop to get people from here to here. And so with that, I would actually like to work with you on cracking the skills code and what it means for your own organization. So as we were thinking about how to do this reskilling and how to practically move people from one place to the other, the thing that I kept coming back to is how can we make it easy? Because you can tie yourself in knots trying to figure out how to do that. Um, and then along came a book. So The Expertise Economy by Kelly Palmer and David Blake came out as we were trying to work our way through this. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, there's a particular chapter that I love on skills quotient. And so it makes it super simple and incredibly practical to be able to identify the skills you need, the level to which you need them, where you are today, and the actions you can take to actually target in and move the dial. And by doing it that way, you also have a qualitative way of measuring how much you've moved the dial over time. It becomes transparent to your employees. It becomes simple for uh, the people in your business you're trying to explain it to, and it's manageable. And so we loved that concept, and so we're actually starting to um, pilot it very shortly within a couple of groups in our company. And so in front of you is a worksheet, and on one side, um, you'll have the opportunity to do a little calculation around skills quotient. And on the back, I've provided a couple of things to support you. So what, I, what my ask of you is, think about your own company. So it could be company-wide, it could be within the group that you work in or your immediate team, or if you happen to be uh, an, an individual uh, company owner, perhaps it's focusing on your own skills. So look and think about the top five you need. Think about where you are today, and you can use any scale you want, but since most of us are degreed clients, um, I actually used the eight-point Lumina scale that's on, on the back of the page. And so identify where you think those skills need to be in the future, and take your best guess of where they are today. That gives you a skills quotient, and the closer it is to 100, the higher the skills. And uh, one thing just to keep in mind is that if you, the skills today are actually higher than the skills in the future, just cap it out at the future number, otherwise it'll kind of make your numbers a bit wonky. Um, so what I would ask is spend about five minutes working through it yourself, and then we'll spend 15 minutes in groups talking about the critical skills that you're most excited about and most focused on, what your skills quotient is, and the one or two actions you're really really keen to put in place within your own company. And then we'll do, we'll have a couple of the tables really report back on some of those insights that you shared within your tables, okay? So five minutes on your own, 15 minutes together, and then we'll get some volunteer tables to share what you discussed. Is it? Okay. As I was walking around, it looks like most tables have had a chance to have a good conversation. And so I'd love to ask for some volunteers now. So who would want to uh, put up their hand and share what you talked about at your table in terms of the key skills, kind of the range of skills quotient that you have at your table and some of the actions that really jump out? Ah, awesome, thank you. Hello. Um, Hello. So our skills quotient are the one that I came up with was 32. It was kind of, maybe I was a little bit over harsh, but um, we work in financial services and there's a lot of transformation going on within this 
um, specific industry in terms of just kind of the turnover and some of the skills needing to be able to build relationships across more diverse communities than maybe financial advisors have had to do in the past. Um, also, the technology is a big piece. Um, we have a lot of people who have been in the business a really long time and are trying to wrap their heads around just all of these um, ways that they can connect to people using technology now and that that is actually being expected of them. Uh, so how are we gonna help people who you know, have never really used a smartphone before be able to you know, start to use some of these tools that we have? And so those were some of the ones um, that I shared, but we actually had somebody else in the exact same industry who had a very different skills quotient that you can share. Fantastic. <laughs> Pass the mic, all right. And by the way, we are all from Minnesota and we didn't know that until we sat down together. So <laughs> awesome. Represent, yes. Uh, so I'm Dave Halverson, I'm with Ameriprise Financial in Minneapolis and um, I had some similar ones to her, but uh, um, the, digital, the digital skills, the basic digital skills, I, um, absolutely. Building relationships are even more paramount now as they bring their value proposition to their long-standing clients whose expectations are shifting as a result of technology and, and things like that. So re-upping re on the, the client experience kind of thing. Um, resilience and adaptability, not just in the face of that change, but also all the regulatory changes they face on a yearly basis. Um, online and social marketing, so that's a bit the digital skills, but it's also um, a new way to connect with your clients, and then innovation. So as a practice owner, what am I doing on a daily basis to stay ahead of the curve? So. Fantastic, fantastic. And so as you think about moving the dial, um, if you think about your skills quotient right now, are there particular things you're gonna jump in and do over the next little while? We didn't get that far. <laughs> but okay. um, some of the things that we are doing, um, we have events throughout the year that we've now established a booth, a degreed booth, where we have um, it just on a display and we have a kind of an open space where people can come in, we can log them in, get their profiles set up, things like that. Um, talk, through, talk to them about what are the challenges they're facing in some of these areas. Um, and we'll continue to do that into 2020 and beyond. Um, and then we also are developing a, a leader engagement strategy um, to get them walking the walk um, in, in showing um, yeah, this is not comfortable for me either, but here's how I'm, I'm leaning into it and working on it, so. Fantastic, thank you. Um, other volunteers who'd like to go next? Vidya? Yeah. Do you have a mic, maybe? Thank you. Thanks, Bella. Thank you. Uh, I was at 50%. You were at, what were you at? 84? Something like that. Something good. <laughs> <laughs> We're at 50%. Uh, we talked about a lot about, of course, the technical skills that people have mentioned. As a, for us at Ericsson, 5G is what we do, but we're on a quest to get our own employees, you know, at a really high level of readiness for that. Um, sales, the notion of empathy in sales and design thinking in sales, being able to be centric to your customer because of that empathy. Uh, empathy was a, a, one of the human skills that we thought was uh, especially difficult. We talked about how do you train someone on empathy? Half the challenge is getting them to want to learn that in the first place. So uh, a lot of our key initiatives are aligned to doing this, but the biggest thing for us is to literally create the dials and put the dashboard in front of the right stakeholders to create constructive discomfort that we're only 50% of the way there and we have to get there. Right. We're at eight. I know you're great, thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Other volunteers? Excellent, thank you. Um, here, uh, we looked at the top five skills that uh, we currently need and where we want to be. Apart from all the technical, uh, I felt that there's a lot of gap in terms of closing out. Today, we enable so many features uh, to the several businesses but we don't close out as to how they're doing, what kind of analytics we could draw from it. So one of the skill that we definitely would need is the analytics and the automation. And the other thing which we are kind of getting started is the conscious culture um, as well. So today, uh, I mean, if you look at uh, where we want to be, uh, of course it's the rubric scale of eight, but from the conscious culture, it's like maybe just one or two. 
So overall, uh, I would say around maybe 45, 50%. Great, thank you so much. Do you have actions yet that you're really honing into? I have a couple, uh, at least for the analytics and the automation. Uh, how the, the biggest problem that we face is how do we generate these insights that are meaningful to the business, that they can connect to their business initiatives? So those are one of, that is one of the action items that I was uh, looking at. And the second aspect of it is how do we better engage employees not just engaging them in terms of learn, 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 but with accountability. Whatever they learn, how much of that is being put into practice, right? So that's what I meant by accountability. Great, thank you, thank you. Anyone else want to share the skills they're focusing in on or what you talked about at your table? So um, actually one of the conversations and it's interesting after listening was really around determining what level is relevant and what you need, right? And that's where we focused a lot of, do you need to be an eight at everything? Because there's so many different skills coming at you. When you talk about you know, the life shelf of skills, do you wanna spend that time investing in somebody moving from a six to an eight, or do you wanna invest that time in expanding their skill set and getting them up to a six and one and a six and another? Um, so that was a lot of our conversation. I don't know if you have insight or guidance on you know, how you're leveraging some of that within your area. Um, yeah. But that's a lot of what we really talked about is, do I really need to be an eight? And that's such an important point. And we've been talking about that at BMO as well. And we actually landed on the side of, you don't need to be an eight and everything. Um, and it'll be different by different roles and different parts of the company and different types of work. And so, you know, maybe a four is okay. Maybe a three is okay in some things, but you need to have everybody at least at that level. Yeah. And for other things, especially if it's your core expertise, maybe you need to be higher. And so by doing the skills quotient, it actually gives you this great way of having a sense of what success looks like and where you are today and how to move the dial. And so that's the part that we really got excited about is because it's okay to have a different number for every single one, but at least it makes it manageable to wrap your arms around it. It's a great point, thank you. Anyone else want to? Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, well, my name is Nidhi, and um, I'll be presenting these lovely lady of, ladies on my table. <laughs> so, um, what I uh, I think basically I haven't done the math like where I stand on on the percentage wise, but I I personally feel I'm pretty ashamed on myself that I need million of skills to improve. <laughs> I think you're but not alone. We're all in that same boat. <laughs> <laughs> but what I have heard from all these lovely ladies, like, you know, we, um, we mainly need innovation and analytic skills. Like, you know, with that's where we lag a lot. And um, I think I've heard like these two ladies talking about, you know, how we can map the competencies with the skills. So that's the biggest challenge that we are facing over here. And, um, um, also, uh, I think resilience was one, and then the judgment was the another one, and innovation is the another one. So those are the things, like, I personally believe, like, you know, that every company mainly focus on the technology skills, but they lack on the other social skills and the soft skills and the judgment out of the box thinking. So that's where we need, and we need to tell the employees, why do you need to have those skills? Because uh, ultimately, you know, um, I think we were discussing everything we measure with the with the success. Okay, down the line, where if I get those skills, where is it gonna take me? Is it gonna take me to the next level, right. uh, step up on the job? So uh, we need to show them what are the benefits if you acquire those skills. Even for me also, like, you know, I, I need to know down the line what I'm gonna get out of gaining those benefits. So until I don't have my vision of what's the benefit that I'm getting, I it's hard for me to pursue my journey towards that, uh, you know, getting those skills. So I think that's yeah. what it was. Like, do you guys want to add anything? Thank you for summarizing. Hi, this is Ekta Lal from uh, Colgate. Hi, Gina. Hello. Um, it's more of a comment which I and uh, she was talking about is we, our organizations have a competency-based framework and we are moving to the skills model. 
we took months to kind of align on what a definition of skills versus competencies is. So it's a very interesting journey. And I would love to connect with people who are in the similar boats. And uh, Gina, if you have any comments, um, inputs, love to hear from you as well. Um, so it's funny, you know, when we were starting out on this journey, we thought, do we need to have a competency model? Um, and we actually uh, paused on that. We'd had them in the past, and they tend to be a lot more complex. They tend to be a lot more political. And to be honest, I could be retired from the company by the time we get people agreeing on one. Um, so we thought the problem we're really trying to solve is what are the skills, the technical, business, leadership, and human skills that we need in the company? So we thought, why complicate it for ourselves? If we're looking at the skills, let's just have a skills framework. And so we went that way, and it was so much faster. Um, and it enabled us to really start to sync up how we were thinking about degreed with our LMS, thinking about the transparency we needed to give to employees. So part of why we're layer, you know, laying the scaffolding in place is because we want employees to be able to say, oh, I'm interested in that type of work. Here's the skills required. Here's the skills I have. Target the development they need to compete for the work. And then as a company, we can look out across our entire employee population and say, who has the skills to this degree? And you know, look for skill profiles that actually enable us to match those people to work. And if we're doing it right, it's not just a matter of us figuring out, you know, here's the top five skills we think we need in a job. We can actually start to get data out the back end and say, let's do some predictive modeling of the people who are the very best performers and then recruit based on that. So still embracing all the other you know, inclusion and diversity areas of focus, but be able to target in on that predictor of success and look across our employee population or out on the street and bring more of that in. And so we thought it actually makes it super simple to start to mobilize on skills and connect the skills to work. Anyone else want to share the conversation you had at your table or some of the key insights? Okay, sure, thank you. And so thank you so much for, for being in this session and working through the skills that you need for today and the future. Really, if all of us are doing this right, we're equipping our companies and our employees to be ready for anything. And so if you have questions along the way, please reach out anytime. Um, I'm happy to connect with you. And I think we're all on a very similar journey. So good luck on your journey and I look forward to staying connected. Thank you.